are here this morning. For me, it's like some of you guys and ladies, I haven't seen in a little bit, but it's a, what a pleasure that you're here today. Man. I love these moments when we get to gather together. This is a this is no doubt one of the greatest moments that, that we could be together. Uh, in just a moment, the kids are going to be singing, and so if they want to go ahead and start coming on up here, Haley, we're good. Uh, but I do want to have a prayer with you all, and uh, uh, we're excited about these kids. Um, they are... Uh, they're the excitement around here, man, okay? I love it. Well, we're delighted that you're here. We get to uh, get to say a prayer together this morning. Um, and uh, I, I trust that not only will you enjoy each other, uh, but that you uh, you get to, you and I will get to enjoy the Lord together in a way that maybe we've never done before. And because uh, he's he is here. So we're going to pray together. Let's pray. Father, I, I am delighted and I'm excited to be here with these amazing people. Um, you, you, you have done some marvelous works in the lives of these folks, and you have so much more to do in us. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited because we, we have... And we enjoy, and we believe in, a risen Savior, not one that remained in a grave, but one that's alive even now, and he's alive in us. Thank you, Father. We could bow to you all day today. Thank you. Bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Don. If you're visiting with us today, I just want to take a moment and welcome you and encourage you to come back. Now, we have a lot of other things going on in the life of the church. A big part of the life of the church and the future life of the church is behind me on the stairs. So we meet on Wednesday nights. Children, we, we eat at 6. Children start their activities at 6.30. We'd love to have your children be a part of this. We have a good uh, summer schedule. We have a good fall schedule. We have a lot of activities. But I've learned one thing after doing this 30 plus years. These children can't drive. <laughs> they can't just get here on their own. So we encourage you to bring your kids and be a part of this. It's worth it. And I promise you, after you hear them sing, as the choir director, the future of the choir is in really good hands. So thank you for coming.
Hello, good morning. This is a wonderful morning. Uh, at ch uh, church that uh, we went to years and years ago, we'd always start this with, He is risen. And they would respond with, He is risen indeed. You know, we serve a Christ that not only died for us, to take away our sins, but he also arose for us. He went to heaven for us to prepare a place for us. What a wonderful, wonderful concept that could only come from God. Could only come from God. And before he did this, he established our communion. The Passover meal that night before he died. And uh, he wanted us to carry this on. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And we do want to constantly remember Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful plan. Your plan that sent your son to live on this earth for us, to teach us, and then to die for us. And then, that's not the end. He arose. He arose indeed. Thank you. We pray this through Jesus, and we all say, Amen.
this church, we have open communion. And by that, I mean that anyone that believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God who came to earth, taught us, and also died for us, and also arose for us, is very welcome to partake in what we're doing here. We always have. And this is in remembrance of what he did on that Thursday night when they had that first communion. And in that communion, he broke bread and he blessed it. And he says, eat this. This represents my body, which, has been, which will be broken for you.
about how that we tend, the, the, our thought processes generally are, you know, there's the shallows, and then there's the midlands, and then there's the depths, and so often we kind of stay in the, uh, in, in the shallows, for example, because all of us are having thoughts all the time. Uh, some of you don't even hardly sleep at night because your thoughts keep running, but uh, it's, uh, we're here this morning and talking about literally the greatest event in human history, and so we want to somehow get to the depths. Thank you, brother, very much. Thanks a lot. I would ask him to get this for me. Uh, so, uh, for example, the shallows tend to be those, the, you know, we're going through our day, we have thoughts that, that, that are important to us, and all of a sudden, boom, just like that, we get interrupted by a text message or a call, or all of a sudden a song comes on, and our thoughts go that way, and then all of a sudden, you know, someone else will, will give us a, whatever, all of these interruptions. So we, we tend to stay in the shallows. And then sometimes we have, there's a certain time in our life where we get, kind of get in the Midlands where, we, uh, where we, we, we think about some of the things, how we feel about stuff. Sometimes we don't like the way we feel about stuff or we, or we are wondering why that started that way. Why do I feel that way? So, we, so the thoughts begin to kind of, go in a very specific direction. And then, of course, the Bible talks about how that God wants us in Psalms. It talks about he, he takes us from deep unto deep. In other words, there's just so much about life still to learn, and there's so much about him to actually be grasped. In fact, the way Paul said it was, guys, I pray, and this was his prayer, I pray that you would be able to grasp, and he talks about how you'll be able to grasp the love of God the height, the depth, the length, the breadth of the love of God, which surpasses knowledge. And so it becomes one of those things that only God can give you. Only God can give you. We find that even with the disciples, because he was telling them, guys, I'm going to die. And I'm going to, you know, they're going to, they're going to, uh, they're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise again. And they didn't get it. They weren't getting it. And somehow they just didn't get it. All of a sudden, if you go over to the book of Luke and chapter 24, and it's all of a sudden whenever Jesus shows up, and he, the Bible says, opens their mind so they can understand. It becomes a very divine experience. You see, the whole thing about Christianity, it's not just about you believing what I say. 
That would be, that would not be the right way to go. It would be that you begin to grasp what God is saying. You see? You grasp it. And you go to the depths. And you go and spend some time with God. And allow, allow Him to make it a part of you. Instead of, instead of someone else telling you how you're supposed to think. Now watch. So my sister yesterday sent me a text. Yesterday morning. It was, I don't know, around 8 o'clock or so. And she said, Donna, this is how she said. Donna, I want to be your uh, medical uh, decision maker on your advanced directive. <laughs> Thought, wow, man, that was a, that was an interesting way to start things, you know. Uh, good morning, Sarah. Uh, you, I'm doing great, and you, you know. Uh, and uh, then she continued on, and, and uh, that was another discussion. But then we continued on, and she was telling me how that how that uh, you know yesterday was the anniversary of five years that she had gone to Paris to uh, run in a marathon. And I gotta tell you guys something, I kid you not, it seemed like it was just like a year, year and a half ago that that happened. And so my point was, was like, wow, and I wrote her back and I said, man, isn't it amazing how that, well, we sure don't have any control over time, do we? Man, it just goes so fast, man. Really, five years ago, I'm saying, I just seemed like it was a year ago, a year and a half ago, we were talking about her going to Paris to run in a marathon. And it's like 50, you know, you know, 55 years old or whatever she was. She's running. And, uh, and so then, then I, I was, as I was thinking about it that yesterday morning, I thought, you know what? We don't have control over anything. And I'm learning in my life. I'm learning everything, everything about my life. I'm still learning, man. Everything. I don't care what it is, where, what area it is. I'm still learning stuff. And I am learning constantly, like, for example, how quickly life goes by, man. It's like, man, what? Are you serious? That was 20 years ago? I, I see people here that I knew when they were like this tall, and it's like blowing my mind, right? Time has gone by so quick, and where did it go? And that's why Moses said, teach me to number my days. He talks to God, teach me to number my days. Help me to know how quick life's going to go by, and so I can appreciate the moment, and so forth. And so... But the reality is, is that we really have no control over life. So let me say this to you. One of the reasons why you and I stress a lot is because we're trying to control a situation. We're trying to control an individual or people. And therefore, we're stressed out because they're just not doing what we want or the circumstance isn't happening the way we want. But there's a really great place to be when you finally come to a place where you accept the fact that you don't control anything. Watch this. But not just that, but that God has control over everything. So what we're going to do for a few minutes is we're going to look at a sermon that Paul preached. And he could have very easily preached it this morning in Acts chapter 17. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to read this together in Acts 17. And then I'm going to kind of, I wrote some stuff to kind of, I kind of paraphrased it. We're going to talk about it just a little bit. And you guys know I care about time. I care about your time. And so we'll be doing fine on time. But let's just read this together in Acts chapter uh, 17. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, uh, Brent, if you don't care, if you'll just go down to verse 22, because that's where I'm going to start this morning. I was going to start in 16. But let me just say this. Here's what happened. What happened in this story, if you go back to the first part of chapter 17, what happened was that uh, uh, the, the, the religious leaders and some of the people that were just so against Christianity, they made this statement. They said, they said that these guys are turning the world upside down. And the reality, now watch this, these are the people that said that are not believers. So what, what I know is that actually they were turning the world right side up. You follow me? In other words, the message actually turns the world right side up. The world in which we're looking at and we're, we're watching, whether it's on the news or wherever you're, whether you're watching it in your own workplace or whatever, it's being turned upside down. And, and, and the fact is, is because we are not aware and we have not been impacted by this crucified Christ uh, and not been impacted by this resurrection. That's why the world continues to be turned 
upside down. And I want you to, so we're going to start here in verse uh, 22. Thank you, Brent. It goes like this. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. What happened so far is that Paul had been walking through Athens there and seeing all the, these images to this God and that God and this God and that God. And then he came up on, on a, a, an, an altar and it said, to the unknown God. And the, what they were doing was, is in case they missed one, they just went in and said, to the unknown God. They just didn't want to miss them. Uh, and so, here we go, and watch this. Uh, Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I want to proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. It's really important. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all, watch this, life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood, one man, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he has determined what he determined their pre-appointed times in which you live right now. And the boundaries where you live of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might Grope for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have even said, for we are also his offspring. Watch this. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. How can, how can a God be something that we came up with if we're his creation? Verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands, here it is, all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. While others said, we will hear you again on this matter. And as the verses go on, basically some believe and some hung out with him and they recognize there was truth there. And so what we want to do, what I'm encouraging you to do is for you to stop. And I don't care who you are, who we are in this place. Don't just take what somebody said. You listen to God by yourself. Because if I can listen to him, you can listen to him. There's no difference between me and you. And so what we see here in this passage, and by the way, that's the crux of the message. Is we have a message of a crucified Christ, but wait a minute. He's not just crucified, but Ladies and gentlemen, he's alive. He came alive like no other religion. No other religion. They follow these guys or girls or whatever that are dead. They didn't come back. Jesus came back. What does that do? The Bible says, for example, in Romans 1, that, excuse me, Hebrews 1, sorry. Hebrews 1, that it, that it authenticates that he is the Son of God. See? 
And so, so what we have here is a God that came to make a radical difference in your life. Let me give you an example of this. In John chapter 5, there was a man. Who was who had, who had laid by a, the, called uh, the, the the pool where this pool would uh, uh, every once in a while it would all of a sudden start to bubble and uh, some believed that if they got in it when it bubbled they could be healed. And this man had been laying for thirty eight years and he laid there. And he had nobody to help him get into that pool. This is the way Jesus is when he looks at people like you and me. Quite frankly, you and I don't have a way to get to God on our own. And that's why Christ came for you. That's why he came. See? Because we couldn't get there. He came. He had a promise from day one. From the time that man sinned, he had a promise in Genesis chapter 3. You can read about it. And so, so what happened was is that he came in there and he asked a question. It's really kind of an interesting question. He came to the man and he said, do you want to be made well? And the man, uh, well, you'd think, well, that's a crazy question. I mean, you know, you would have to think that. Well, of course I want to be made. I've been, you know, I've been like this for 38 years. I've not been able to walk. Couldn't get in there when I think they're bubbling up, by the way. Uh, they believed that it was because a spring would come in and uh, sometimes more water would come in there and it would cause it to bubble and so forth. Whatever the case, whatever the case, this man was hoping to be made well. You know, it's a really good question. Do you want to be made well? Hmm. Do you know that, you know, whether we're talking about sickness or we're talking about, and by the way, the whole book of John, what a beautiful book, man. Uh, what a beautiful book. It'll, it'll shock you with some of the things that are said in it. Shock you if you look at it. Um, but but this, this man, uh, he looked at and he asked him this question. Some people really are okay with being ill. Did you know that? They are. They're okay with it. So what is that about the attention they get? It's like the attention. I mean, I don't know anybody like, I don't, I don't know anybody like that, but I want you to understand there, that I've met people like that. I have met people like that. There are some people who, uh, who like whatever they're doing in their life. Like they don't really want any help because they kind of like what they're doing. Even though... Even though God's message is, and I want to share this with you, even though God's message is one of repentance, let's talk about that for just a moment. I love that word. I, I love it. <laughs> for me personally, I love it. So why in the world would you love the word repentance? Sounds like, you know. The reason why I love the word repentance is because two things. One is that God is involved when repentance comes in. God is involved. In other words, the Bible says, for example, uh, uh, Acts 13, uh, we think uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, there's another passage, uh, Ezekiel 36, that, 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 that God is the one who enables you to repent. Some people don't want to be made well. No, I'm good. I'm good. There are other people um, don't believe that in change can really take place. Man, this is the way I was born. This is the way... It's going to be, and this is, I can't do anything about it. I just can't. I, I can't do anything about it. It's a good place to be, by the way. I can't. I just can't do it. It's a good place, because that's when God can step. That's half the problem. See? Um, and some people um, have simply accepted it, but then there are those people like that guy. He knows he needs help. And that's me. Every day, man. The more I grow in my faith, the more I'm going, God, I need you. Listen, you have far less control of your life than you realize. I mean, you can go back to, I mean, your name. Did you choose your name? <laughs> Did you choose it? Well, no, I, did. I like my name, but I didn't choose it. Some people got a name, I'm thinking, man, their mom and dad must not have liked them a while. You know? <laughs> Golly, I think, but don't say that out loud. But, 
But, but then, nonetheless, uh, there are some people, and I hope you're one of them, and I'm one of them, is that, God, I want you to change me. Yeah, I want you to change me. See, I want that to happen. The power of the cross, ladies and gentlemen, is a, it's, 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 it's powerful. Even as I speak to you, it's not just for those other people. It's not. It is for you. Um, let's read this together. Let me just kind of run through this. Uh, if you don't mind, Brent, we'll bring up that. Remember those two paragraphs there. Sorry, guys. By the way, I just have one point in my sermon today. And I'm kidding. Uh, so I'm going to repeat what, what I read as I read Acts 17, okay? That's all I'm doing. Your unknown God is the one I speak of today. He's the creator of the universe and everything in it. He cannot be contained in a building, nor does he need anything from man. He is the creator of life, breath, and all things that exist. From one man came every nation to dwell, and he even appointed our places and times, which leads us to the obvious conclusion that in our finiteness, he's infinite, we are finite, and our lack of control and lack of divine knowledge, that we can seek the source of everything good. Now let's keep going. That next phrase, it said this next, he made himself near to every one of us. What it said. Because God is divine alone, he cannot be created by man, nor shaped into an image. Now he has revealed the sacrifice that satisfies his wrath. And he has provided a divine holiness that, watch this, works its way in us. This is really important. That works its way in us by our willingness to repent. Watch this. God has appointed a day of judgment that pro proves our continued existence by his being raised from the dead. We will continue to exist once this body is done. So let me give you my last point, which is my first point. I'm just kidding you guys, right? I'm trying to get down to one point is the whole idea here. And I haven't succeeded yet. Let's go, if you'll bring up those next three things and then we're going we're gonna to kind of, kind of, uh, kind of wrap this all up. Okay? Alright. So, these are the first two. We've got one more. I don't know if you caught verse 25, but it said, God can't be worshipped from man's hands. You guys, got, you guys don't have anything. You don't have anything. Watch this. You don't have anything. Why? Well, because he's got everything. He made everything. What can you give him? What can you give him? Right? Well, what's so beautiful? So it's, the, it's the best kind of love, really. Parents, you guys, you guys have a real good feel for this. Those of your parents and grandparents, you have a real good feel. Your kids don't have to give you anything. You're going to love them. Right? Am I right? <laughs> they don't have to give you anything. I love it, you know, if my grandchild says thanks. It's like melted me all over the floor. Right? Right? Uh, yeah, you, you, yeah. Parents, you, you have an idea of this. But nothing like God. But, but God wants your attention. God wants to fellowship with you. First Corinthians chapter 1, we talked about it, is that, that he has called us into fellowship with his son. Wow! This, it's, it's the greatest kind of love and, and, and the reason why God even brings up repentance is because you're going down a path, listen, you're going down to a path of emptiness, uh, one of pain. I'm going to say it again. The reason why he needs you to consider to repent and come back to him is because otherwise you are going down a, 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 a path of emptiness and pain. And so God is not served by man as if he needs something, which is bad news for those who assume they have something to offer. If, they, if you think that, hey man, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and as long as I go to church every Sunday, and well, you forget all that stuff, man. I'm showing up, you know, I'm showing up, man, because I love the people, and it's like, God, I, you're all I got, man. You're, you're it. I, it's, it's all I want. It's all I want, man. If they're going to be reading the Bible down there, I'm, I'm going. If they're going to be praying, if they're going to be praying, I'm going. Because why? Because he meets the deepest longings of my soul. That's why God is a jealous God, because 
He's going, what in the world are you chasing after that for? There's nothing you can compare to me, he says. Let's keep going. Second one. God is, well, I'm so, thank you, Brent. God is not served by man as if he needs something. Same thing I said before. Which is good news for those who know they have nothing to offer God who has everything anyway. So what God did, listen, Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And listen to me. So he came to serve you. Jesus came to serve you. You know how he did it? He carried your sin. We have that third one if you don't mind, right? He carried your sin to the cross. And then he gave you his righteousness. Watch this. This is what it says. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So here's what he did. I'm taking your sin. I'm taking your sin. And I'm going to give you my righteousness. You know what's so amazing about when he gives you his righteousness? Is that that begins to work its way in us. That's why we have a desire to repent. That's why we have this desire to do what's right. Because he's working his way in us as we get, as the more we grow in our faith, the more the sin is no longer that satisfying place of life. God cannot be served to appease his judgment because Jesus took the judgment. But rather he serves us by carrying our sin on the cross and providing his righteousness. Friday night, I'm going to close, but Friday night we uh, listened to a testimony. It was, it was great. It was about, it was about um, how God stepped in to a life that, like us, all of us in this room, all of us in, all of us in this room, a life that was broken, um, a life that uh, by, by herself had no direction, but God stepped in. I want you to think about your life. Everything, I'm going to close, everything that is impossible with you, everything, it's possible with God. It's possible. Go to the depths. Go to the depths. Don't, don't take what somebody else believes. No. Uh, um, I'm excited about Jesus. I know he's my savior and I know that he'll save you. But don't, don't just accept that. You go to the depths. You talk to him. Because if I get to talk to him, I promise you, you get to talk to him. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'll help us get beyond the shallows. You'll help us get to beyond even the midlands where we, we think and process I pray that you'll help us to go to the facts and allow the facts of a crucified Christ and a risen Christ. Huh. God, I need you. And every person in this room I know is desperate for you too. And you're not far from any one of us, right here in this room, not far from any one of us. The one who, who gives us our breath is not far from any one of us. The one who gave us our family is not far from any one of us. The one who's provided every meal they've ever eaten, not far from any one of us. May all of us call out to you. The word says... And if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Thank you.
invitation goes like this. If God's spoken to you, say, you know, Don, I, I do. I want Jesus in my life. I don't want to leave this place. I don't want to leave this place until Jesus is in my heart. I would invite you. I'd love to pray with you. You don't need me because you and God can talk, but I'd love to pray with you. God can do the impossible in your life. God's spoken to you. I'm inviting you to come. I'd love to pray with you. We're going to sing together. He's the cornerstone. Stand with me, please, would you? Because I really don't want you to miss what God has for you. And anytime we open this book, we're going to find stuff that God has for you that will blow your mind. God bless you guys. Uh, where's Kenny? Kenny, you around here somewhere? Hi, hi, hi. Way back there. <laughs> I couldn't see you, man. But would you lead us in a prayer in closing, brother? Father, we do that, man. Thank you for nature, man. Thank you.